Heather McKean, and I'm the marketing manager with Littleton Regional Healthcare. Um, I would like to start by thanking the LRH Auxiliary. They, uh, through a generous donation, make these events possible. They sponsor each of these virtual series that we've been able to do throughout COVID and kind of beyond. Um, and we will be recording tonight's presentation and it'll be available on the LRH website, the LRH social media channels, as well as the LRH YouTube channel for anyone that may have missed us this evening. Um, and then I will go ahead and introduce Dr. Dougald MacArthur, who's an orthopedic surgeon with the Alpine Clinic, and Holly MacArthur, who's our family nurse practitioner. And with that said, I will go ahead and turn it right over to MacArthur's for their presentation. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Happy fall. It definitely felt like fall out there today. Uh, so just a little background about the clinic. Uh, Dr. MacArthur and I do most of the knee and hip replacements within the practice, and that's what we're gonna talk about this evening. We also have spine service at Alpine Clinic, sports service with uh, sport injuries of uh, shoulder and knee, uh, hand service, so we end trauma. And so we try to give the community everything they need to keep you healthy and keep you out there being active. So tonight, we're going to focus on knee and hip arthritis. Uh, that's basically what we manage most. And what we're going to try to go through, you're going to be seeing our slideshow here now. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see it. And I'm sorry to interrupt. I failed to mention that we will be taking Q&A uh, throughout the presentation. Feel free to submit them through the chat and Q&A functions at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll go ahead and do address all the questions that are submitted at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Heather. Uh, so the objectives tonight, we, we really want this to be pretty laid back. We want it to be as if we're talking to you in the office, sitting right next to you. Um, obviously, we're in your houses on your screen. So we're going to go over what exactly is arthritis. We get that question quite a lot. The symptoms that occur when you do have arthritis, a brief overview of what we can do conservatively to treat it. And we will also go into surgical options as well. Um, and then the implants themselves. A lot of people would like to see exactly what they look like. There are some definite myths, I think, about what the implants look like and what the surgery looks like. And with that, um, we're gonna start just by talking about what exactly is arthritis. So we have a rubbery soft tissue covering over the ends of our bones and that gives us cushion. Any hunters out there probably have seen that when they uh, cover up their deer or whatever they have um, hunted. So as time goes by, that cushion from impact um, starts to get a little bit thinned, maybe from injury, things of that sort. And so there are kind of four stages of arthritis that we talk about. There's the thinning of that nice, beautiful white cartilage. It looks kind of like a white cue ball. So it gets kind of thinned. And then it starts to look like a shag carpet. Uh, most of you hopefully remember what that looked like. So it looks real shaggy. <laughs> uh, after that, then you start to get what we usually refer to as like little potholes in your cartilage. So little defects where you can see uh, cartilage loss and, and bone that's exposed. And then after that, you get full cartilage loss where all of the cartilage is gone and you have exposed <clears throat> bone. And when that happens, you start to get bone spurs that will, that will form. Um, there's a lot of weight directed right to the bone. So it gets very, very hard, almost like marble. And so those are the changes that we see whether we see it on x-ray, MRI, or we see it when we actually do your surgery. And there's also, I'd like to add an inflammatory process to the arthritis. This is more the mechanical part, uh, but the lining of your knee, the synovium can also get irritated and that can cause swelling and that can cause achiness and discomfort as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Dr. MacArthur now. So, when we see patients in the office, they, they'll often ask, how did I catch this? Or, or what happened? What caused it? And uh, the, in simplest terms, too many birthdays is what usually causes it. Um, we all get arthritis. There, there's in varying degrees. 
Some get it younger, some get it older that are, that are uh, lucky and it doesn't really affect them much. The people that are most unlucky, they've, they've got a genetic predisposition to it and they, their joints will start failing even in, as young as their 30s and into their early 40s. And then if you have traumas, whether they're sports injuries uh, as a kid or sports injuries as an adult uh, or fractures around the joint, those, uh, those traumatize the cartilage and oftentimes the cartilage is injured and it starts to come apart even at the time of that injury. And you might not even feel that for a decade or two, um, but that's often the event that starts it. Um, when we see people in the office, we'll often use the analogy of a, of a smooth paved road representing a, uh, a nice young healthy joint, but then after a winter and, and some traffic, you can start to see potholes starting to form. And we all know those potholes, they never heal themselves. You just slowly watch them get bigger and the, and the road gets rougher and rougher. And so osteoarthritis, which is what most of us get as we get older, um, it's really just a bearing that's failing. It used to be smooth when you were young and now it is, uh, now it's becoming more rough. So it's a mechanical problem. Um, I'm looking at the list on this slide. Prior surgery is also a trauma. Weight, um, most adult Americans struggle with weight, whether they're a little overweight or a lot overweight. Um, the heavier you are, the more you're gonna feel this. Um, Thinner people absolutely tolerate hip and knee arthritis better for a longer period of time. Um, there's no real evidence that, that um, walking on cement floors uh, or walking too much exacerbates arthritis, but a lot of people like to attribute it to that. And then, of course, it does become more and more common as we get older. The unlucky people are bothered by it in their 30s and 40s. Um, the people that uh, are more lucky don't have much issue with it until they're really quite old. The, the people that we see for surgical consults in our practice, um, the typical age range is 55 to 75. That's the very large group of people that we see. Um, my youngest knee has been, I think, 36 years old. My youngest hip has been 28 and the oldest hips have been in their early 90s, and the oldest knee has been 96. So um, it, it's quite a broad range. Uh, uh, and the bottom line is when, you, when your joint is bothering you enough and nothing else is working, there's a pretty good surgical solution to both. The symptoms, um, that we talk about is essentially just pain, pain and swelling. Uh, a lot of people will, will hear about um, uh, water on the knee. Um, that's, that's what, as the joint becomes irritated, it forms fluid and that fluid will come and go uh, as, as the joint is irritated or as it calms down. Uh, as osteoarthritis, which is just the aging type of arthritis, there's startup pain that people will talk about after they get out of the car or when they get up in the morning. Um, and then they feel okay, whether it's 20 seconds later after they've been moving or 20 minutes later, we hear varying uh, timeframes on that. Stiffness is a, is a big symptom. And uh, this swelling that's on this list in the super patella pouch, that's just swelling around the knee and what lay people call water on the knee. Clicking and grinding, that's on the previous slide when I was discussing the smooth surface failing and becoming rough. That's what's happening. Um, you're feeling the different surfaces that used to be smooth. Now they're not, so you're feeling clicking and grinding. And then another symptom, this last thing that's listed on this slide, shin pain or pain just below your knee on the front of your shin. That's very, very common. We'll have patients sometimes come in the office and they'll say, no, no, it, 
my knee doesn't bother me at all. It's right here on my shin. Let me take an x-ray of their knee and it's fairly well degenerated. Uh, I might just add to, we, we get a lot of questions about Baker's cysts. Um, patients will come in and say, well, you know, my, my primary care physician told me I have a Baker's cyst. And whenever we hear cysts, I, I think most of us wonder if it's something that needs to be removed. And I like to try to explain to patients it, when the knee is irritated, it's going to make fluid. And, and we all know water likes to go on the path of least resistance. And so in the front of the knee, we have our kneecap and we have the big muscle, our quad muscle. And in the back, it's kind of, it's kind of free. You know, there's the capsule of the knee, which is kind of a balloon, a balloon around the knee. But swelling will kind of go toward the back of the knee, push out the back of the knee, make it feel very stiff. And, and that really is what a Baker's cyst is, is swelling in the back of the knee. It's not, it's not really truly an encapsulated cyst. It's, it's a side effect of the knee being irritated. Yeah, uh, 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 patients will, they'll be told either in a radiology report or sometimes through um, different specialties, oh, well, you have a Baker's cyst. And they often don't understand initially that the Baker's cyst is a result of the arthritic knee. Um, the Baker cyst isn't really the problem. It, it's, it is the arthritic knee making fluid as it becomes irritated. And then as Holly was just saying, the fluid pushes out the back of the knee to, through the path of least resistance. And that's what people call a Baker's cyst. So the, the treatment for the Baker cyst is usually treat the knee arthritis. These x-rays, um, these x-rays, I'm hoping everybody can see this pointer. This, this is a knee on the inside or the medial side of a knee. This side of the knee carries most of your load, 80 to 90% of your body weight. So it, it tends to wear much faster than the outside or the lateral side of the knee. This black area right here, this, this black area demonstrates cartilage remaining. The fact that there is no black area here or just a very faint line, this x-ray demonstrating the cartilage is completely gone and there's metal or, or bone rubbing on bone, which if anyone's ever seen worn out breaks taken apart and the pad is completely gone and there's metal rubbing on metal, this is the human equivalent of it. And this, this represents pain. A lot of folks, we're going to have a slide showing an implant, but a lot of folks think a knee replacement is opening the knee and removing this entire section. That's not at all what it is. All the knee replacement really is, is removing this rough surface on the tibia and the femur and just replacing it with a new smooth surface. So it's essentially just a uh, resurfacing. And so on this left picture, we see. I'm gonna go over the three compartments of the knee. There's the medial compartment, the lateral compartment, and then on this, this picture on the right, this is the kneecap. This is called the patellofemoral compartment. You hear of partial knee replacements and total knee replacements. A partial knee replacement refers to replacing any one of these three compartments that has very isolated problem, but the rest of the knee is okay. It's very rare to find those people. Most of the time, uh, most of the time, it, it's just not an appropriate operation. So a total knee replacement means we're replacing all three of the surfaces of these compartments. This is just another. This is just another X-ray of of uh, the other side of the knee. Again, the medial side is completely gone with bone on bone changes here and the lateral side still has some cartilage remaining. Are you gonna do this one? Or am I doing this one? So when we see patients in the office, we always try to go over conservative treatment uh, leading up to the most aggressive treatment. Uh, so one thing that we try to talk to patients about, and it's not an easy thing, to discuss for sure is staying as light as you can. And that's how we try to put it. If you can lose even a pound of weight 
that translates to about four pounds going across your knee or your hip, you know, or your spine. And so we always encourage that if possible. Uh, trying to avoid activities that are, are big impact, such as running, um, mogul skiing, you know, skiing have, you know, very hard and doing big moguls where there's a lot of impact through the near the hip. Rather, you know, try something like swimming or biking. So some activity modifications that way. Anti-inflammatories, if they're appropriate for you, if you're able to take those uh, medically you're sound to take them, they can be helpful. Strengthening is, you know, gentle strengthening is something that we often will talk about. Um, sometimes we will send people to a little bit of physical therapy just for the strengthening portion of it. There are different braces as well. Some braces give support as the knee gets arthritic. Now and again, it'll feel a bit unstable. And so there are different braces to give it support and some compression to help with swelling. We also have the ability to unload the knee. So Dr. MacArthur was just showing you those x-rays where you had bone rubbing on bone. And on the other side of the knee, you had a little bit of space left there. So what we can actually do is either with a brace at the knee or a, a wedge that goes underneath your heel, we're able to transfer a little bit more of your weight to the side of the knee that has cartilage left. So we're unloading the side where you have bone on bone, trying to just decrease that grinding uh, daily. Those, do, those, won't, those braces and wedges that Holly's talking about, they don't fix anything. They might make your symptoms diminish. And if you're lucky, you might get another year or two before you have to go to surgery. Yeah, all of these conservative treatments that we're talking about do not fix it. Um, they might mitigate your symptoms for a while. Um, then we talk about in different injections. And so we can inject steroid where that is just a high powered anti-inflammatory. I often describe it to my patients like we're putting water on a fire. We're just trying to get things to settle down a bit. It might help one day, it might help eight months. Um, so that's a little bit of a crap shoot that way. Visco supplementation is a big word for hyaluronic acid, which is another big word. Um, and a lot of people used to know it as the rooster shots. They, they used to be made from rooster combs. Uh, now they're synth synthetically made. So it's not true liquid cartilage. Um, it's a derivative of that and it can help keep the cartilage that you have healthy. It has an anti-inflammatory property to it as well. Um, and, it, and it does, it lubricates the knee. So that is something that we'll use if we're trying to get more miles out of the knee. And it works well for some people and, and other people it doesn't, it doesn't do much for, but um, people come to us and, and part of our job is trying to avoid surgery for as long as we can. Um, we, we get patients that want to have surgery, but it's not convenient timing either for their employment or for things going on in their personal life. And uh, these things that Holly's talking about are, are really just the tools that we use to try to buy them time. And then of course, if, if all of these fail, and, and we absolutely have left out a few, that you can talk about doing natural anti-inflammatories, uh, turmeric, arnica tablets, uh, things like that. Osteobiflex, chondroitin DS, these are all supplements that you can take for joint health. I usually tell people, if you think of them as a vitamin for your joint, you don't take a multivitamin every day because they make you feel amazing, but they have been shown to be helpful. And then of course there's surgical intervention when everything has failed and you're sick and tired of not being able to do things in your life that you enjoy doing. Um, there is arthroscopy versus arthroplasty. That is basically a knee scope where we go in with a little camera is the arthroscopy. The arthroplasty is the replacement. An arthroscopy is, uh, it's an appropriate operation for a knee that is in fairly good shape and might have an isolated cartilage problem. Um, it is not an appropriate operation for a knee that's very arthritic. Um, what used to be called a, a quote unquote clean out 20 years ago was a very common thing to do. 
it, it's been studied a lot and it, it, if you're going to end up with a joint replacement, it's been demonstrated that statistically it makes no difference. You're going to end up with a joint replacement. And so um, arthroscopy for arthritis is done really very rarely anymore. So the things that we talked about so far are modifying your activity. That's, that's a lot of words that basically says, if it hurts, try to avoid doing it. Um, Anti-inflammatory medicine, Tylenol, trying to stay as light as you can, and then injections of either steroid or hyaluronic acid. All of those things have a fairly good track record of helping for a period of time in a, in a period of time for some people might be three to six months, but it might be three to six years in other people. So th they're all very worthy to try. But at some point, those things stop working and the arthritis becomes more and more bothersome and it starts interfering with things that are important to you, whether it is going to work or spending time with your family or, or whatever might put a smile on your face. And even the most stubborn people, if it starts interfering with their sleep, they'll come in and want to know what else can be done. And so this surgical approach, um, this is a diagram of uh, a fairly lean knee. If you take away the skin and the subcutaneous fat, this blue line shows what's called a medial parapetella incision. This is the most common way. This is the doorway to the knee. Essentially, you take a knife and you open it along this blue line. And the, the kneecap, which is right here, that is slid off to the side, and then the knee is open for us to work on. <clears throat> people, people wanna know what happens to their ligaments. On this drawing on the right side, this demonstrates the medial collateral ligament. You keep that. In the middle, this cruciate ligament, the posterior and anterior cruciate ligaments, they generally get sacrificed. The designs we have uh, that we typically use don't, don't keep these. The, uh, the shape of the implant compensates for losing these. On the lateral side, which can barely be seen in this drawing, you keep that. The uh, quadriceps muscle and patella tendon here, you keep that. That's absolutely necessary. Um, the most important, the, there's different types of implants that are used in different situations. Um, patients will ask frequently, well, what type of implant am I going to get? They're generally like the, the large car companies. There's five or six that, large companies. The implants, they tend to be very similar. 90% of the implants manufactured in the world are, are made in a small town about the size of Manchester, uh, Warsaw, Indiana. Uh, so the, the vast majority of them are, are American made. Um, it's a small engineering community. The, the implants have improved a lot over the last 20 years. The engineers migrate from company to company wherever they're getting the best uh, employment package. So there's a lot of crossover technology. We use the implants that we use because the company that represents them gives us very good support. We live in rural USA and it doesn't matter if we're doing surgery on Christmas day, their reps are there. The, the, the stacks of trays that hold all of the different sizes and the equipment, they're very complex trays. And the, uh, the, the operating room staff is dependent on the company's representative being there and helping identify um, all of the equipment and how it goes together. So the two most basic um, designs that we use, one is cemented. And if someone is elderly with poor bone quality um, or is medically ill and they don't have poor bone quality, even if they're younger, we're gonna use a cemented implant. That's the, the, uh, the bone to metal bond is going to be like a grout you would use 
on a tile floor or an epoxy. This, uh, this line where it says biologic ingrowth, that's essentially an implant where the undersurface of it is porous metal and initially friction just holds it. And then over a two to three month period, the bleeding bone grows into the porous metal and there's no cement at all. Um, then this last line, cobalt chrome versus tantalum or titanium. The cobalt chrome implant from an engineering standpoint is probably a better implant, but it has a very small percentage of nickel in it. And nickel is the most common metal allergy. It's found in jewelry and glasses and coins. And most adults that are old enough to have osteoarthritis, they know by that time if they have a nickel allergy because, um, because when, they, when they use any, anything metal, it causes a little bit of a rash. So if, if anyone comes to us, we ask them, do you have a nickel allergy? If they're not sure, if they describe some vague incident where they think their skin reacted, we will use a tantalum or a titanium implant. Um, it has absolutely no nickel in it. Again, from an engineering standpoint, the cobalt chrome implant shows better numbers on paper than the titanium implant or the tantalum implant. I've put thousands of these in and um, I can tell you that in my experience, the patients cannot detect any difference in these implants. So if I'm even mildly concerned that somebody might have a nickel allergy, we just use an implant that has absolutely no nickel in it. This is, a, um, this is just a little picture, uh, this one on the left. When I said on an earlier slide that it's just a resurfacing, so this top piece is the femoral component. And you see- Or the end of your thigh bone. Yeah, this is the end of your thigh, just the, the top bone of your knee. And you can see it's very, very thin. And so we just remove the rough surface and this new smooth surface is put on. I'll often refer to it as a bearing change. Um, if there are any, anybody that is mechanically inclined or taken any, any bearings apart, you look at this and you can tell it's a bearing. This bottom piece, this is the tibial tray or your shin bone. And then this, um, this white piece, the engineers call this direct compression molded polyethylene. I call it over-engineered, overpriced medical plastic. Um, on this slide, I don't have the ability to blow this up any more than it is in this program. But if you look at it closely, you can see that um, there's porous metal on that. Uh, it, it, yeah, there it's blown up just a little bit. Um, this, if you were to blow that up under a microscope, it looks like coral. So initially when we put this on somebody's femur, this is a biologic ingrowth implant. Friction initially holds it in place, but over a two to three month period, the bleeding bone grows right into that porous metal and that's the long-term bond. And then, um, how do I get this over here? Uh, there we go. This little button is the undersurface of the kneecap. A lot of people will come in and they'll ask us, am I going to have my own kneecap? Everyone has their own kneecap unless so much of it is worn away then that it can't be used. But what the kneecap goes through arthritis as well. And all we do is remove the surface and this little plastic button with these three peg holes, there's three drill holes and this gets attached to the undersurface. And then this new smooth piece, this becomes the new surface of the kneecap. Hold on, we might have some technical difficulties for a second. Yeah. So often when when we're 
taking care of a patient and they're at the time where they're considering having their knee replaced, we want to try to do a bit of coaching and we do a lot of education with our patients trying to get them prepared. Um, a knee replacement is absolutely a process. It is not a surgery where you wake up the, the next day and everything is, is <laughs> wonderful. Um, I, now, some people do, they have such terrible knees that the surgical discomfort they have is, is better than what they had going into surgery. But inherently, because the knee is a hinge joint, it wants to get stiff and it wants to get stuck. If you can envision a capsule around the knee, um, when we do your surgery, you have bleeding within that capsule or that balloon, and it's like we threw glue all over everything. So the most important thing after physical or after the knee replacement is physical therapy. We oftentimes will say that our job is the fairly easy part. Your job with the physical therapist is the hard part. Um, you have to always battle that scar tissue that's trying to form and trying to give it, get it stiff and get it stuck. Uh, discomfort, swelling, some bruising. We absolutely expect that after a knee replacement. I think we've gotten pretty good at, at managing that and uh, supporting our patients and, and getting you through that first few weeks. Now, when we talk to people, people often say to us, well, when can I drive and when can I get back to work and when am I back to normal? And of course, the big thing for driving is which leg is it? Um, if it's your right leg, of course, you need to be able to move that quick enough to react to drive. And the, front, the police frown on you taking any narcotic pain medication and driving. So those are kind of the two things. There's no set date. It really just depends on how you're doing. Um, some, some people... We have patients driving as quickly as five to seven days. That's very unusual. Most of the time, it's two to four weeks. Um, it's not. It's usually not much longer than that. And then, as far as um, I don't think we have a, a slide that talks about outpatient versus inpatient. Um, at at this point, we've been doing outpatient hip and knee in Littleton for a few years now. Um, if you're age 70 is not a hard cutoff, it's a, it's, it's a rough caution. Um, usually we'll say age 70 and below people that are reasonably healthy and they have a, a reasonable household with, with family support, whether it's a wife or a husband, um, or family that can be with them. Uh, and then the will to do it, uh, we can do 99% of those people outpatient. People that are less healthy um, uh, or just older, just like we all get arthritis, we all get an unknown amount of artery disease. Um, so we will, we will keep older patients in the hospital at least overnight. Um, and most patients, even folks in their 80s, are, are just staying overnight now. If anybody's struggling for any reason at all, they'll stay longer. But most people do not stay more than one night these days. Um, occasionally, we get people that really are loners, and they don't have much family or friend support. And we hang on to those folks a bit longer for certain. If we're, if we're able. Um, yeah. Um, I think that's it. That's what I had to add for, to that. Okay. So we're gonna slide on to, into the hip now. So, it, and I, we're gonna have question time at the end, I think Heather said as well. So the hip is a little bit different animal because it is a true ball and socket. Um, so normally the pain that is generated by the ball and socket of the hip is in the groin area, right in the middle of your buttocks, and in the front of your thigh. And so a lot of patients will come to us and they'll kind of touch that bony prominence on the side of their hip and say, well, it hurts right in the joint. And, and it really isn't, the, the joint of the hip is really front and back. A lot of times we'll hear patients talk about a catching pain in the groin when they twist or pivot, when they're going to swing their leg out of their car, when they're turning over in bed at nighttime. 
And the other one we hear quite a lot is they have difficulty reaching their foot to put on their sock or shoe, paint their toenails, clip their toenails, that sort of thing. That, that range of motion gets more and more difficult. And with the significant arthritis, because of the loss of cartilage, if you remember that x-ray of the knee where you saw the bone on bone and the other side had, of the knee had plenty of space still, when you lose the cartilage in the hip, sometimes you can actually feel that your leg lengths are, are different. And that's from the loss of that cartilage height. So I'm gonna talk about, uh, this is, these are two x-rays. This is a front view of a hip, and this is a side view of the same hip. Um, this is the pelvis. This is a ball and socket. This is the actual portion of the hip. Um, this is a very arthritic hip. There's no joint space remaining here. All these little bubbles that appear on these x-rays like right here, and then there's another one right here. This, these are indications that this, is, this joint has been making fluid just like we talked about in the knee. And there's a capsule, so it, it be, as the hip joint makes more fluid, it comes under pressure, which is number one, very painful, but it's a confined space. The fluid has nowhere to go. So it actually pushes into the bone. Um, and that's what makes these little bubbles uh, that look moth-eaten or sort of like something's been eating the bone. And it's really just, just fluid. When we see it in surgery, it, the, the fluid congeals and it actually looks like apple jelly. So this is a horrible hip and uh, this person probably can't get to surgery. This is a person, if they showed up in the office, we would, we'd probably just skip uh, conservative care and just ask them when they wanted their hip replacement. Occasionally, um, you'll get people that will say they don't want a hip replacement and it's not cancer. You can live with this for as long as you can tolerate it. And occasionally, it's rare, but occasionally we'll meet somebody that is actually seemingly doing reasonably well. And then the question that I always ask is, well, why did you make this appointment? And, um, uh, they give answers that, that I, I still, after 20 some years doing this, uh, I, I, I don't quite understand. Because, but 90% of the people, this x-ray would be incapacitating for them. So these, treat, these treatment options are, are virtually identical to what we already talked about uh, in the knee, very, very much the same. Injections in the hip, um, unlike the knee, they tend not to last. Sometimes we'll get, um, we'll get uh, a patient that examines in their description of what they're feeling. It sounds very much like hip arthritis. And I'll examine them on the exam table in the office. Their hip doesn't move very well, but the x-ray is really not impressive. It doesn't look anything like that x-ray we were just looking at. It looks like not quite a normal hip, a mildly arthritic hip. And you just think, can this really hurt this person that much? So we'll often inject those people. Um, and if, it, if the injection gives them even a brief period of improvement, um, it helps make the diagnosis. Sometimes we'll send them for an MRI MRI is a more detailed look at the, at the joint, and that'll often show us um, a more beat up joint than we can see on x-ray. Um, people ask, well, do you do your hip replacements from the front or from the back? I do 99% of them from the front. Um, it is referred, this table, this funny looking table that's in this bottom picture, this is the table that's designed specifically uh, to give good access to the front of the hip um, and allow us to do this through a really very small incision. It's often referred to as a minimally invasive surgery. Um, I think that's a garbage term that is sort of a marketing tool. Um, it, I, 
I say it's a maximally invasive surgery done through a small hole. But it is a small incision and a lot of patients are impressed by that. Soft tissue balancing in the hip, that really means um, how do we keep it stable? How do we keep it from dislocating? You might've heard of hips dislocating. It's a much more common problem with a hip done posteriorly than through the front. Um, this term shucking or pistoning, that's basically in the middle of the surgery, we have trial components. It's like being in a shoe store and trying on shoes. We try different sizes and I put my finger around the trial size and I'll pull on the hip and feel how tight it is. So we wanna make sure that it's tight and stable and it's not going to dislocate. But we also want to reproduce the patient's native anatomy, and that's proper leg length. Um, if it feels at all loose, I can make the hip wider and longer, and it tightens up the buttocks muscles like a rubber band, and that actually makes it more stable. Um, we don't often have to make them longer than the patient's normal anatomy, um, but if we have to, if it feels too loose, yeah, you trade a leg length discrepancy for that, uh, for that stability. Um, thankfully, that's not much of a problem. The hip implants, there's a, the, the cup or the socket that goes in the pelvis. Um, that's called an acetabulum and trabecular metal. That's just like on the knee implant. It's porous metal like coral and the bone grows into it. That metal liner, um, just like on the knee implant, it has that over-engineered, overpriced medical plastic that clips into it. And then on the top of your thigh bone, the femoral stem goes, and there is a, uh, there's metal heads and ceramic heads. And uh, we will use a ceramic head 99% of the time. Our dog is having a party, if you can hear her. <laughs> this picture um, on the right, this actually shows the implant that we typically use. This, uh, this is the stem that goes in the femur. Now I'm going to go over to this x-ray on the left. This is the stem. This x-ray is just an x-ray we pulled off the internet. This is not the stem that I use, um, but it's close enough for an explanation. And then the, uh, the cup is up here on the right. And then, so you can see it also has porous metal on it. And then um, the liner, this overpriced medical plastic is this liner that clips into it. And this really works very well. And once again, if anybody has, is in the audience that's taken a bearing of, on any machine apart, you can once again see this is just a bearing. Folks that have advanced arthritic hips, as Holly had said earlier, they have difficulty reaching their toes. The hip will flex and extend, but it often doesn't rotate and hasn't for years. You can look at this picture. People that come to see us in the office, we have these implants to just put in their hands and they can handle them. And this is silky smooth. And most people that are coming to see us, their hips haven't moved that way in many years. And it, and it shocks them how smooth it feels. And that's very true. Hips are definitely, hip replacements are definitely a bit easier to recover from than knee replacements. Normally, even though there's surgical soreness um, and it's a big procedure, a lot of hip patients tell us they can tell that the pain they had before surgery is much improved or, or that the hip moves more smoothly. Um, it's generally, an easier recovery. They don't want to get stiff and stuck. The physical therapy is not as rigorous. It's normally once a week and we don't have you start for at least a week where physical therapy for a knee replacement is two to three times a week. And we have you start PT a day or two after surgery. If you stay overnight with us, you start it that day. Um, big things, the thigh muscles, we kind of spread those apart to get access to your hip. And so they get a bit swollen. Sometimes they get a little bit lazy. They get a little achy. Um, 
occasionally patients will lose the ability to, to lift the leg after surgery for a few days. And that's, that's kind of normal because the, the muscles get angry, irritated, and they decide they're going to take a break for a few days. One of the differences, hip and knee replacement, the, the knee is definitely a more challenging um, recovery for the patients. The hips, we send everybody home with a narcotic prescription. We don't, um, we don't want anybody to be miserable. We do our best to make this as civilized as possible for people. Half the hip patients don't even use the narcotic prescription and they'll come into the office and tell us, I was sore, but um, I just took some Tylenol and that was enough. That's generally not the case with knees. Um, and, and Holly was just talking about physical therapy. A knee replacement, there's a small percentage of, of people that breeze through that like it's nothing and they act more like a hip. But the vast majority of knee replacement patients, it's a bit of a battle of stiffness and swelling. And the physical therapy is tremendously important. The hip replacement patients, most of the hips, they could probably skip physical therapy and they'd be just fine. But if you go to physical therapy, and some surgeons don't send hip patients to, to physical therapy, but we do. And we think the purpose of this surgery is to get you back to a more normal functional life as quickly as possible. And going to physical therapy will absolutely get you there faster than if you just pretend you're doing home exercises. And essentially it gets back to, you know, strengthening the muscles you've been protecting because the hip has been so uncomfortable. You're not walking correctly. Your gait pattern is, is not great. And so that's where the physical therapy um, steps in, but it doesn't tend to be as long as long length of time in recovery as any replacement. So um, post-operative for both knee and hip, this isn't a surgery where you sit and you rest and you don't get up out of bed for a few days. You're out of bed directly after surgery. As soon as you're able to get up with physical therapy, you're able to put full weight on both the hip and the knee. Um, there are no precautions with the knee as far as bending it or straightening it, doing your exercises, you're not going to hurt it. Uh, with the hip, uh, anterior approach, we, we do ask that you be careful putting your foot way behind your head, um, you know, big, different, big flexion. Um, you know, we just ask you to be kind of careful uh, because we do repair the capsule of the hip afterwards, but it has to heal. The way we close all of our incisions are with all absorbable sutures, which is kind of nice. There aren't any staples or sutures to take out after. And we seal it with a derma bond, which is a, probably an over, overpriced super glue, uh, medical grade, that basically seals the incision. It's not foolproof, meaning you can't touch it, poke it, scratch it. We ask you not to submerge it in fluid, but you absolutely can take a shower. And we encourage that, you know. Um, you pat the incision dry and that skin blue kind of flakes off like a sunburn flakes as time goes by. So it's pretty easy to take care of. Uh, they don't tend to leak or, or cause issue. Physical therapy, if you stay overnight with us, you're doing physical therapy in the hospital. Uh, if, you, if you go home the same day, then we ask that you have physical therapy for a knee replacement starting with one to, one to three days usually. For a hip, we have you wait a week. Um, outpatient, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, Dr. MacArthur went over that we look at your age, we look at your comorbidities and your medical history, if you have home support, um, that sort of thing. And, and that's something we'll help you decide when we see you in the office or we help our patients decide. We also want to give a shout out to Haley Ireland. She's not on, on this presentation with us. She's a nurse practitioner that works with us. She's part of our team, really important and helps us a lot. So you might also see her if you come in to see us. Thank you so much, Holly and Dr. MacArthur. Um, and with that said, we'll go ahead and open it up for 
questions. I see one coming through. So if there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen as well as a chat feature. Either of those are acceptable. I'll monitor both and we'll give it a few minutes for those submissions. Uh, the first one we have is very informative. Thank you. In general, can one walk right after knee surgery? I have a question about knee replacement. I've heard about a custom fit where the incision is made through side instead of front. Can you speak to this type of knee surgery? Yeah, that, that's a different approach. There's um, uh, mine is an interior approach to the knee, not, not the side approach. The arguments are that that um, the the side approach um, will get moving faster. I haven't seen anything anything in any of our journals that shows that that's actually the case. Um, the custom fit knee that's I would call that again a marketing. Um, that's a you're talking about the conformist knee. That's a that's a brand name, um, and there's no evidence that that does anything particularly special either. Um, so uh, I think you can get a good result with a conformist knee uh, or a side approach. Um, the surgeon that's doing it just needs to be skilled at it. And I also, to, to kind of go over how we, we size you during surgery. We have instruments during surgery for both the hip and knee where we size your, your bone. We do trials. Um, like Dr. MacArthur said, it's kind of like you're trying on a pair of shoes. And we have all of the implants then that we have all sorts of different sizes that, that our representatives bring for us. So, um, you know, that's decided in surgery and it, and it doesn't take all that long to, to figure out how what size you are. They're, the different sizes are all in stock. Essentially, when the knee is exposed, a caliper is placed on the different bones and that's how they're measured. So they're measured in real time. Um, and it's, it's very analogous to going to a shoe store and putting your foot in the old shoe sizer, which is essentially a caliper. And then you try on the sizes. Um, and you see how it feels. I hope that answers Linda's question. Hi, Linda. It looks like we have another one. How long after surgery can I play tennis? So um, there, tennis, how, when will you feel up to that? Singles tennis is not recommended. Doubles tennis, is fine. And the, the reasoning there is the amount of pivoting and the shear forces put on the implant. A lot of, uh, there's been a lot of debate about this in the orthopedics community internationally. And the current consensus is doubles is okay. Singles is probably putting too much stress on the implant. Um, when would you be able to play I would say if you're having a very good result, probably three months, but you might not feel like it for six months. The whole recovery, the hard part and, and the, um, the important part to both of these surgeries is the first month or two. Um, the, uh, the whole recovery for any, uh, any substantial trauma and any of these surgeries is indeed a trauma is it 18 to 24 months, but the, the, the hard part is the first month or two. So you might be playing, you might be playing tennis at three months. I would say the window of you playing tennis would be three to six months. It's not to say you won't be having a functional life. You, you might be walking into a restaurant two or three weeks after your surgery, but you ask specifically about playing tennis. Thank you, Donna. You said lots of good information here. Uh, so Chris, when can I start? Oh, I'm sorry. What is the expected lifetime of today's implants? So old information used to be approximately 10 years. These days, 
I would expect 15 and hope for north of 20. Um, any of them can fail early. The most common uh, early failure will be either a trauma or an infection. The infection rate for these surgeries in Littleton is a fraction of the national average. Um, we're very proud of that because that's us and the staff there. Um, so that's not a, 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 a big issue in Littleton, um, but a trauma falling from a ladder um, or just getting too heavy and overstressing the joint or perhaps playing an aggressive game of singles tennis. These things can cause a joint to fail early. Most people that come to see us, the big group again is 55 to 75. Most people never want their joint visited again. And they are, uh, they're happy to, to put some constraints on what they would otherwise do. Um, I tell people all the time, you can hike, you can bike, you can cross country ski, you can downhill ski, you can snowshoe, you can play doubles tennis. I, I think that um, pivoting sports uh, like soccer or basketball or singles tennis are a bad idea and you're asking for trouble and an early failure. And then um, when can I start walking and hiking? One, one thing that we didn't mention, especially with a knee replacement is I tell people all the time, if I had to give you one little hint on the big thing you needed to really pay attention to would be to manage your swelling after knee replacement um, for several reasons. If it gets too swollen, it's very, very uncomfortable. Um, if it gets real swollen, it puts pressure on your incision um, and it just makes your recovery harder. You're trying to push to get range of motion with physical therapy and it's just hugely swollen and uncomfortable and that's difficult. So as far as Donna wanted to know, when can I start walking and hiking? You're up and walking the day of surgery. And it, and it really, our, our rule of thumb for our patients is you can be up and walking as much as you like, but you have to honor that swelling. If it starts to get swollen and it starts to get real big, you have to lay down, put your foot way up high, put some ice on it and back off a bit. So general walking, you know, that comes back as your swelling and your strength improve. To go for a, an aggressive like long hike, I think you're probably looking at maybe that three month, three month mark. Yeah, we've had, I've probably implanted over 4,000 knees there's a short list of some very special and somewhat lucky patients that that return to aggressive activity pretty quickly. Um, and there's many components there that, that there, there's genetics, there's uh, mental strength and will, there's a certain amount of luck um, uh, that allows those people to do it. Most people, like Holly said, wouldn't be hiking for probably about three months. Um, there's a, there's a, a short list of people that would probably do it sooner. Uh, and then our last question right here. From my first hiking boots, I started having problems with my knee. Once hiked Musilak, went to church and genuflected and lost feeling in several smaller toes for years. Realized I depended on Swizzling my foot. Oh, maybe swinging my foot oh, out. Okay. So I did not go over the top. Still ski in my 80s, but find even rocking in a chair, I feel the stress and have to cant my foot outward. What is happening in the knee? Barbara, that's a difficult question. Um, I, I'm not certain I fully understand it. I think um, we'd probably need to see you and actually x ray your, your knee and um, look at your look at your hip and look at your knee and um, and just see what's going on there. Um, I'm not sure I can I can uh, give you a good answer just based on that information. Did we get all of them? That is more? all that I see on my end. It's 701, so we'll give it just another minute for any last minute questions to be submitted. Um, but I do want to thank you both for hosting this tonight. Um, great information, well attended. I think 
there's a lot of takeaways here. And again, this session is recorded. Um, it'll be available online in the coming days. And I'm sure um, the Alpine Clinic and the office staff would be happy to assist any of you further. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. I don't see any last minute questions. So with that, we will, we will come to a close. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.